Bon, alors voilà, deux films. Euh... Oh. Non, non, il peut être dans la même place. Donc je ne dois pas être un profil. Je juste voulais faire un commentaire sur la restauration. Les deux films qui ont été plus sur la main étaient. Ils ont fait des DCPs de l'original uh, negatives de uh, films. Et. Um, Um, but but for Super Eight and a Half, um, uh, at a certain point, I lost all the negatives of both No Skin Off My Ass and Super Eight and a Half. But I lost the negatives of the both films, and so we started trying to track them down where they were. And uh, it was like detective work. You know, and we found them in the archives in Paris. Because that we given them to teach her the subtitling places. But the last reel of Super Eight and a Half, I I lost. So I lost the negative. So that's why it looks so shitty. Um, it's like really dark, and because we had to just take it from an old um, uh, film copy. So I think I have it in storage somewhere, but um, <laughs> for the I think we'll find it, so maybe someday there'll be another restoration. Is uh, John Waters a big influence uh, on that movie? Uh, I would say he's a big influence for me in general, yeah. I, um, I met him, uh, one, I met him at a book signing before I even made my first film, so I was a fan. And, um, but then later when I became a filmmaker, we became friends and he's always been uh, supportive of my films and in terms of my, some of my premieres and stuff. And, um, but yeah, of course his sensibility is, I mean, I, I, I've been totally influenced by, uh, a lot by the gay, what I consider the gay avant-garde, the great gay avant-garde filmmakers, starting with um, you know, Genet and, and kind of anger and through the 60s with Warhol and Paul, Paul Morrissey and, and Jack Waters and, and then and then John Waters, and, sorry Jack Smith. Okay. The, the, so the when you did no, no skin of my ass, did it super? How was it shown? It was in super in super eight prints or? Yeah, when I first showed the film, it was I showed it on super eight, and the, but I didn't even have the sound on the film, so I had the sound on a on a cassette, and I would show the film, and then play the music separately, um, or the soundtrack separately, which is interesting because I, every time I would start it at a slightly different point, and it would, like, the sync would be different every time I showed it. So it was kind of experimental in that way. Uh, but then when we blew it up to 16 millimeter, uh, then we married the soundtrack. <coughs> And then, uh, uh, just add, in Super 8 and a half, the, the films at the end are, were shot on Super 8 as well. And, uh, but the film itself was shot at 16. In the end. But, uh, this one is supposed to be in sync, Super 8 and a half. Um, but uh, in terms of this not syncing, um, you know, uh, I shot Super 8, uh, No Skin Off Mass, silent. We didn't re even record sound during the shooting of it, so then it was all post, post dubbed but, uh, you know, we, but because of lack of, we just did it in one afternoon or something, so we didn't have time to go back and do it more than once, so that's why the sync is kind of bad. But of course, for me, I think it makes the film much more charming uh, to be out of sync. That makes sense for me. <laughs> So a sound is out. My early films, the sound would always plague me, and uh, even my a later film, uh, The Raspberry Rice, it was so low budget that, and my producer would always like hire people like that he could pay no money. So he would like hire somebody who doesn't know how to do sound recording, like to do the sound recording, and uh, so the sound was unusable for Raspberry Rice. So. Um, the whole film was post post up, um, but but we had enough of a budget to do it over like three or four days or uh, five days, so um, it's quite uh, precise the the, the in, uh, in that film. So 
if you didn't know, you might not know that it was about that. But I've always wanted to make uh, now like uh, another film that is deliberately out of sync, um, like even with a big big budget and make it out of sync as a deliberate provocation or something. But it's, it's that would be you know very I think it would be difficult to convince a distributor or, or you know a, a, a producer to allow you to do that. But maybe someday I'll do it. I just I just will tell a story. The the, the for this film was. Uh, it's the first time I shot on 16 millimeter. The first time I tried to do sync, tried to do sync sound, and uh, so um, it was a torturous like processor. Uh, it took me two years to complete the film, and I was just working as a waiter and as a bartender and self financing it with some help from Jurgen. Um, it was just one of those things where I knew I had to finish the film, but um, because if I didn't, I probably wouldn't continue making films, you know? And so just <coughs> completing the film for me was a triumph. Yeah. Uh, Super 8 uh, Half was harder to make than The Skin of My Head, right? Yeah, because, I mean, Super, uh, No Skin of Mass was, Super 8 cameras are so easy, easy to use, you know, and, uh, and it wasn't sync, so, so I just shot most of it myself, and, the scenes I wasn't in, it. and uh, I edited it myself. And, um, uh, the technology is so easy, but with, with uh, just when you're working in 16, it's, you need more expertise so, to, to do it. And, uh, it was a bit more ambitious in terms of locations and, and uh, the scope of the film. But the film, I mean, the film premiered, I think, at the Toronto International Film Festival, and then, and it ended up playing at Sundance even, uh, when Sundance was still a kind of independent film festival. And uh, uh, actually, the same year, I think it was this, yeah, the same year Super 8 and a Half played uh, was the premiere of Kids at the, at Sundance, and that's when I met Barry and and Harmony. Uh, at that sentence and became a good friend of Harmony at that time. But it was amazing um, to me that uh, that they programmed it, you know, with, with the blow jobs and, and everything. Uh, um, they played at a lot of international film festivals, which was quite uh, surprising to me. You often said that you, you ended up shooting up Super 8 and a half, uh, almost surprised and exhausted, right? Uh, it, like I basically kind of had a nervous breakdown during making the film, uh, which is reflected in the film. It's very autobiographical in that sense. Huh. But but those first two, the first two films, No Skin and Super and Half, really were shot not like a traditional film. So it wasn't like I started uh, shooting and had like a two week shoot or you know three week shoot. It was just shooting here and there scenes wherever I, whenever I had time or the money to shoot them. So it was a long process to, to shoot it that went on uh, over the two year period. And, um, and then it was one of those things where I didn't know when to stop. So I kept on shooting and kept on shooting. And then at a certain point, it was just time to, because I've had friends who, who never finished, have, have made films that they never finish. And they just keep, they can't quite finish it. They just keep shooting more stuff. And I mean, it kind of happened with, uh, with Jack Smith eventually, where he, he just couldn't finish the film. He was just constantly revising and shooting more. And, and Do you feel nostalgic about this, this period, <coughs> uh, of this time when you can shoot film on, on film? Oh, yeah, that's, I mean, uh, it, for me it's very interesting that I started out making uh, films on film and had that experience. So. Super Enough was completely shot on film and completely edited in the old style, so on the steam back and with the bins, you know, with the strips of film and the bins and um, no digital editing at all. And then with, uh, and then uh, uh, Hustler White was shot on 16 millimeter color film, uh, but edited on a very early crude um, digital editing system. It was 
of the division. But it was, this is getting really ge geeky, but um, like, uh, there was like uh, oh, so only so much information that you could put in the digital editing system, so you had different uh, edit uh, files, but you uh, edit decision list that was called EDLs, but you couldn't um, cross-reference between the five files, so you couldn't tell if you repeated uh, pieces of film before because you couldn't <laughs> use. Uh, this is going to be complicated um, because you could have, because you couldn't repeat because you, if we finished on film, so you only can use the, the, the negative that you have. And then, um, so you had to do readouts, uh, literally like readouts, where you looked at all the the files and kind of made sure that you didn't by by your eye, like to make sure you didn't repeat a, a file. You know. So um, anyway. That makes me feel nostalgic because it was like this kind of um, bizarre, kind of torturous process uh, uh, compared to how easy it is. And, uh, and then for, also for me, just as a side note, the whole transition from film to digital was very interesting and kind of traumatic, especially aesthetically, because I totally resisted um, video aesthetic uh, at the beginning, and I tr <coughs> was trying to make, to figure out how to make film look, video look like film, you know, which you really couldn't do back then. Um, and then, but now when I look back at my early digital films, I, I really appreciate the aesthetic, but at the time I really hated it. No, no, it was shot on uh, uh, HD. Yeah, but we, but we, we shot with these, 70s uh, Zeiss lenses on uh, uh, like Alexa, and, and we and then in color timing we tried to make it look like a 70s 35 mm. It works really well in the <laughs> so you can do. But even Otto, my film Otto, I shot half on Super 16 and half on uh, HD video. Uh, HD video. Yeah, so Thank you so much, Bruce. It was a great honor. Thank you. Thank you.